We turn again to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, the words of uh, verse uh, 30, 58, this last verse. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. When we read St. Paul, we must always do God for Paul's so that force. Because time and again that word occurs, therefore, therefore, therefore. Because Paul is always addressing the mind. He's always arguing, always throwing conclusions by logic from what he said, from what's gone before. And we find that here, we have this great therefore. He's been speaking of the triumph of the Lord over death and the grave in the resurrection. It tells us that death has lost its sting, the grave lost its victory, and then, then he goes on to say, therefore, this follows, uh, abound in the work of the Lord. And I want for a moment tonight with you to reflect uh, on uh, this great uh, uh, exhortation, this imperative that Paul gives us. Uh, what does it say to ourselves uh, in our time uh, and our place? First of all, we have this phrase, the work of the Lord, or the Lord's work. Or what we have in Jesus and Luke, Luke's Gospel, my father's business. And it distinguishes, of course, between this work uh, and other work. Because we have our daily work. We work to earn our bread and work to provide for others. And Paul isn't in any way uh, minimize the importance uh, of our own daily work. That work really matters, and that work is itself uh, a divine uh, command. The fourth commandment lays that down for us. Six days shalt thou labour. Of course, the seventh day is holy to the Lord, but there are six days in which we have to work by God's uh, own director. Six days shalt thou labour, and do uh, all thy work. On a course in paradise, Adam and Eve had to work. Before man ever fell, he had to work. Even as sinless and holy uh, and perfect creatures, they had to work, they had to guard the earth, they had to serve it, they had to till, cultivate the soil. And so even in Eden, there was always work for their hands to do. And indeed, I believe that if we come, when we come to glory, there will also be work for our hands, because we have bodies in glory as well. And these bodies won't be useless or redundant in heaven. We'll find uh, a use for them. And so work matters. It's God's command. It's a we earn our bread to be dependent upon other people. It works. It matters enormously. And it's true, of course, as well, that work occupies a large proportion of our time in this world. We spend so much of our lives in the workplace. And that's often our real community. Not our neighbours, but our workplace. We spend so much of our time there. And it's so that you and I must shine as lights in the world and bear witness to the Lord and do good to a fellow men and women. Because, as I said, uh, it is really our community. Uh, there's so much talk of community today. Uh, where is it? What is it? And really, to a large extent, it is a workplace. And in that workplace, we have to serve God and love our neighbour. And so there's no disparagement here uh, of the workplace or day-to-day -day labour the way that we earn our bread. But there is uh, this other uh, distinct and distinctive form of work that Paul calls the work of the Lord or the Lord's, the Lord's work. And what he's saying to us is this, that God has his own project and God wants us to work with him on that project. We are God's 
fellow laborers, as Paul says uh, elsewhere, partners together with God. This project that he has to establish his own kingdom in this world, to evangelize the world, to bring the gospel to all the nations, to redeem men and women, to put salvation within their grasp. I'm told that Coca-Cola has a business aspiration or strategy to place a bottle of Coke within reach of every man, woman and child on the planet. And they're very successful in doing that. But you have a similar strategy to place Christ in the salvation within reach of every man, woman and child uh, in the world. And what a challenge that is. That's God's project. And God wants us to be part of that project. God's co-workers in this great project of bringing salvation uh, to uh, the whole world. Thomas Chalmers, who was a great Fleet Church founding father, spoke of his vision. He called it the Christian good of Scotland. It wasn't simply a spiritual good, but it was largely that. But it was Scotland, not a denomination, but the whole country that he had in mind. He had a vision for Scotland in its entirety. And it embraced, of course, the gospel, but also it embraced uh, uh, the poor and uh, injustice and so many areas of society. That was all part of his vision. And so here is God's project to establish his own kingdom uh, in this world. That's God's work. And God says that we are to be involved uh, in that project and in that work. That is the Lord's work. Now, of course, there is also my own work. There's my day job. There are families to support. There are others who need us in different ways. With John Knox's vision that we should all be schooled to be able to be useful members of, so, of our community. And that does matter. We need engineers, we need doctors, we need all kinds of the building trades and so on, and we need bin men and shipbuilders and uh, surgeons, consultants, all these things we need for a, a, a functioning society that, that matters enormously. But beside that we have this, we have the Lord's work, the specific work of the kingdom, God's own special project, his favourite project which he planned from all eternity and he wants us to be involved uh, with him uh, in that project. And so there's what he's saying to us. There is, Paul says, the Lord's business. There's my business and there's the Lord's business. They're not strictly uh, uh, in intention with each other, but they are distinct. Because we can be very much involved in our own work, even as believers, and yet not involved in the work of the Lord at all. And Paul is saying here, being bounding in the work of the Lord. And then you notice this as well, that Paul expects every believer to be involved in the work, in the work of the Lord. This epistle begins with a greeting uh, to the saints in Corinth. And the whole epistle is addressed to all the saints in Corinth, every single one of them. Now, in many ways, they were a strange bunch and a difficult bunch. This is Paul's first letter, as far as we know, and it's the most difficult one Paul ever wrote, because there were serious difficulties between himself and the church in Corinth. They disliked him, and uh, they found fault with him, and they contradicted him, and very often they thought he was rubbish. And yet Paul hangs on to this, that they're still saints. And all these saints have to abound in the work of the Lord. There are no exceptions. Every one of us is obligated, is commissioned, and is gifted for this particular work uh, of the Lord. Whatever our age or abilities may be, we are all to be involved in the work uh, of, of the Lord. Now that obviously means uh, some who have special functions, like the apostles themselves, and uh, 
the prophets and evangelists and so on who were also part of the setting up of the early church those many centuries ago. That includes still, of course, those who are uh, preachers and those who are elders, those who are deacons, again with the stated tasks. But there are so many, many others on whom this work depends. And indeed, Paul is saying to us very, very often that if, if one component part of this engine malfunctions, or this machine malfunctions, then the whole part will malfunction and the whole part will suffer. And so every component part must be in its proper place and doing its own proper work. Every single one of us. You'll find this in the early church as well. There were people of, of no great prominence and yet they were key in the matters that affect the church very directly. You are, for example, Chloe and the church in her house. We know almost nothing else about her, but she gave her house. She was probably a very wealthy woman with a large home, and she gave it for the church's use. That was part of her work uh, for the Lord. You have uh, others like Silas, who was Paul Samanuensis, and to be put it down by dictation. And that again was, he wasn't allowed to put his own thoughts on the paper. Maybe he thought he could say it better than Paul, or have some profound ideas that Paul had forgotten to mention. But he doesn't take the apostles' words down, word for word, because that was his service. That was his work uh, for the Lord. And we find many such cases where uh, humble believers remember when the Lord himself went to, uh, on that last journey to Jerusalem, he was accompanied by a woman from Galilee who cared for his needs. We know the names of some of them, but only of a few of them. But they were obviously very important to him at that particular time. And we have the house of, at Bethany of Mary and Martha and Lazarus again. We, they, they, we don't hear the names at all in the book of Acts. And yet they provide a, a haven for the Lord. That was all. A resting place. And of course he sat at his feet and took in his teaching as well. They loved him so much. But still, you see, they weren't officials. They weren't ordained. They weren't trained in some theological seminary. But still they had their own work to do in the Church of Christ. And every one of us has this opportunity and this obligation. I think, for example, of the early days of the Free Church, not so long ago, in fact, was say, say the early days. It had to find finance to provide stipends for 800 ministers from scratch. And that was a huge task. And Thomas Chalmers, a man of so, so many talents, as preacher, theologian, philosopher, writer, organizer. He had this idea of what he called the sustentation fund. You may remember that, some of you, I'm sure, that fund so important in our childhood for the maintenance of the church's ministry. And it was a very simple idea. There were collectors went round every home, belonged to the congregation once a month with a wee book, names, addresses, and they got the names, they had the money, and it went into the book every single month. And whatever the weather, summer or winter, these collectors went out with their books once a month to collect the sustentation fund. There was no great kudos in it. They weren't specially gifted people, but they were absolutely essential to establishing a church would on to build hundreds of schools and manses and churches. An astonishing achievement in a very short space of time. And at its heart, there lay these people. People who've been working hard probably all day long, and yet rain or sunshine, storm or snow, out they went to collect the money. And Chalmers had this principle, what he called, the power of littles. 
the accumulation of little things or little talents, cooperation. What it meant was this, a lot of little people collecting little sums of money from little people. And that built up. And he gave stipends to every minister in the church and until very recently. And that's the point here. It doesn't need to be a, a great labour that uh, amazes the world and wins us uh, recognition. But our own thing. Remember the widow, she did what she could. Every one of us with our own. Our witness in the workplace, inviting others to church, that is such an important point. When I was in Glasgow a long, long time ago as a minister, we had some young folk in the congregation, and I called them trawlers, because every Sunday night they brought their Hall of Residence friends to church. Some converted and some not, and some vowed never to come back in case they'd be converted. But they were brought to church faithfully. That was their contribution. And it may seem a small thing, but yet it was so, so important. So you cannot say, I have nothing to offer. I have no talent, I have no gift, nothing special. You hire yourself and you ask, Lord, what will thou what will you have me to do? Uh, Titi Bonhoeffer, the German Lutheran martyr, who was killed by the Nazis in uh, June 1944, he used to write home from prison and kept, kept on saying, are we of any use? Because he felt so useless. And every day he would ask that same question. And one prays, Lord, make me of some use. Because retired people aren't very much use, are they? And yet, you know, one hoffer from prison, he wrote letters. And today these letters inspire thousands and millions all over the world. They inspire you too if you read them. And so there he was, like Paul in prison in Rome perhaps feeling useless, and yet in that uselessness still speaking to us words of inspiration and encouragement. And so I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm saying find for yourself. Find your niche. Find your opportunity. Find your obligation. Find your moment your own contribution to this great project, God's plan for the world, and your part in that plan for the world. And so there it is, we're all to be involved uh, in this project that God has undertaken. We are to abound in the work uh, of the Lord. And then you see, he, he says to us that we, we are to do it abundantly, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's not just, you see, the, the, uh, the specified amount of time. You cannot say, oh, so many hours, or so many days, or so very, very much, or just so far. I have this strange idea in my mind. I heard a, a definition once of a feast. It was a a Henry Tudor definition of a feast. And he said, a feast, he said, means more than enough. And I thought, that's great, that's a feast. Enough is a meal. But a feast is more than enough. And it's that idea we have here, always abounding, always more than enough. Not in the sense that more than the Lord deserves, but in the sense that it's, it's not measured or measurable. It's not like I've done my bit or I've served long enough. 
I've done my share. Because we may have done that and still there is another opportunity. There is another need arises. Another moment when God says, get up and do. Abounding in the work of the Lord. Now I'm not saying I abound in the work of the Lord, I don't. But I feel the weight of it and I feel the guilt of omission. Because Paul is speaking in a way that rebukes me. Abound in the work of the Lord, not just enough, but, but more than enough. And you know, sometimes we say, I don't have the gift. But you know, Paul is saying to us this as well. It is your labour that's not in vain in the Lord. Yes, we abound in the work, but the work is labour. And you know, sometimes if we have gifts, we feel we don't need to labour. Now, these people had gifts. You know, they had a huge proportion of tongue speakers and prophets and miracle workers in the church at Corinth. And yet Paul is saying to them, your labour is not in vain. And you see, Paul, he spoke of being in labour more abundant. Because this work, yes, it will achieve something. Achieve, in fact, a great deal. But not by some magic wand. Not without effort. But by labour. And you know, sometimes the more gifted you are, the less inclined you are to labour. And that's a fatal peril for so many, many people. I spoke once to a colleague in Edinburgh who was telling me that one day they had Jesse Norman, the great opera singer, uh, for a graduation at Edinburgh University for seeing an, an honorary degree at Edinburgh and deserved it. And he would charge a scorcher in the procession. And he said to her in jest, we should make you sing for your degree. And she said, if I had to do that, she said, I've had to be practicing for, for, practicing for four hours this morning. You could think, oh, she could sing off the drop of a hat. But she didn't think so. She had this amazing talent. The range and reach of her voice. Its expressiveness. Its precision. But she had to train four hours for a simple performance that's how she saw it there's a famous comment that one professor passed once on a preacher a student preacher on trial and he made this comment mr so-and-so he said as the famous as the fatal gift of fluency oh you would say that's a great gift, fluency. But he said, no, it's a fatal gift. Because a man with a gift might not want to labour. Because he could preach from his bath in the water. He has such a gift. You come back to what is the proverbial sentiment. Genius is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. Labour. Put Adam and Eve thrown out of the garden. In the garden, it was easy to work. It was a pleasure. But then outside, as they made their way, their solitary way out of Eden after the fall, it was a world of thorns and thistles. A world for the eternal bread, for the sweat of their brow. All success comes at a price. We have musicians here tonight. How many painful hours have they spent in childhood honing their skills? Hander as a child, I'm told, spent six hours a day at his piano. He was a genius. 
And part of that was adding yourself properly to, to labour, to work, stirring up and perfecting the gift that God had given him. You have gifts. I'm not speaking to the gifted. I don't see the gifted. I see a congregation where everybody is gifted. For you're all charismatics. All endowed with God's spirit. And yet you are so endowed you must labour. And to labour is not in vain. Why is it not in vain? Well, a few verses before this, Paul had said to them, If Christ has not risen, then your faith is vain, and our preaching is vain. It was vain if Christ had not risen. But he and the Corinthians, although they differed on many matters, they were assured in one thing. Christ had risen. And because he had risen, their labour was not in vain. He had risen and that showed that God reigned. He had risen because he had risen. He had all the authority in heaven and earth. And he went with them. As they laboured, he was always with them because he was the risen Christ. But above all there was this. The fact of his resurrection meant the possibility of resurrection for every human being. Christ had risen. A man had risen from the dead. And that rewrote history. It was possible. God could do it. And the Corinthian skeptic said, how do the dead rise? And Paul said, you fool, God. Just needs the one word. And it was in vain because they had this message. Go and tell the world the resurrection of the body. Not just the immortality of the soul, important though that is. The Corinthians held the body in contempt. They were Greeks, it didn't matter, the body didn't matter. But it did matter to Paul, and it mattered to God. And he would raise these bodies imperishable and glorious. Labour is not in vain. Go and tell the world, give the world, the poor, poor world, which I, I read last night, on my phone this afternoon, we are facing hell on earth because of climate change. Such fear, such hopelessness, such despair over what a tragic is a humanly, a man made tragedy. And into that hell on earth scenario, we have this. Christ has risen, death's been conquered, the grave has been conquered, Le telling the world that it's not vain, because it's been done, Christ has risen. And so then I come back to the workplace, and when you go back into, into your day-to-day -day community, give a reason for the hope that is in you. The hope of life beyond death. The hope of a glorious resurrection of the body. That's your message. You labour to advance that project. To disseminate that hope. To people who fear the living or they're facing hell on earth. Tell them Christ has risen. Tell them the dead rise. Give the world hope. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, labour abundantly in the work of the Lord because it's not in vain. What enormous potential 
this gathering represents tonight. They have each give the Lord a feast full of their labour. What a future. That's what Paul is asking us to aspire to. Labour because labour is not in vain. May God help us and so to live. O oh Lord, go with us, we pray. Help us to proclaim you and the hope that is in you, knowing that the future we promise has itself been confirmed in the past. We want, Lord, a repetition of what you had done before when you raised the one man, Jesus, and in him gave hope and proof and a pledge of a resurrection and glory into glory for all who believe in him. Help us, Lord, to labour in your project for your name's sake. Amen. <laughs>